When uh, the owner and I first started the design process, he came to the table with a pretty defined design intent of maintaining the loft space um, and upgrading it to uh, really contemporary details, but without um, removing the kind of historic value of the space. What's interesting about when you first walk into this loft is that you have a very obvious kind of wow moment, right? You might see photos, you know, of the listing online and it's th them themselves are impressive, right? But when you actually walk into the space, um, you definitely have a wow moment right away. Three thirty White Avenue. I bought the, the loft in March 2017, and uh, construction took a while. So it took me maybe a year living in the space to feel the space and be, decide what I wanted to do. I started the construction somewhere in 2019, and it took three to three and a half years. That's a long time. But let's not forget that COVID was in the middle of it, and that didn't make things very easy. And so the construction was fully completed somewhere like in 2021, 22. And I've been living in this beautiful space, fully finished now for about two, three years. My concept is to open the space. You may see there's a, there was a wall, the trace of a wall there. And so actually, destroy walls. I remove some separate bedrooms to create a totally open space. I know it makes the space a bit more specific for the buyer because they're sometimes looking for two, three bedrooms when you have so many cubic feet, but I want to do the opposite. You can always add walls, that is not complicated. What's complicated is to get a completely open volume. That's impossible to find. You can fill it if you want to. You can add sheetrock in three, three bedrooms if you want to, but that was definitely not my intention. We repositioned some demising walls between the units. Um, there was a, a small land grab from another uh, adjacent apartment, and we also extended um, a bit of the loft space, and therefore uh, structural steel and framing was necessary to uh, support that. So my design philosophy is always to go to very old pre-war places and keep the shell as authentic as possible. So what I did here, one of the first work is to really go back to the original state of the shell. So the brick walls were basically kept intact. I worked the floors to make sure that we had the original factory floor with all the details of the machine, the old trays, the, really the feeling of what happened here before. The ceiling was fully painted and I had to spend days, weeks, manually grinding with diamond blades to go back to the original concrete. So the shell, back to the original. The inside of the shell is the opposite. It has to be super minimal, super clean and zen. And I like the contrast between the two. The kitchen is um, an assembly of custom millwork. Um, we tested various 
layouts uh, based on the appliance package that the owner wanted to implement. If you were to ask me what's my favorite color, and I would tell you it's gray. Now, some people will tell you it's not a color. For me, it is a color. But gray itself is not working. It's multiple shades of gray all together, working together is really my motif. And so, yes, gray is a base, and then you warm it up with a bit of wood tone, and so a beigey wood uh, combined with gray is, is exactly my, my theme. And one of my rules is no handle whatsoever. So if you see one handle, you fail. And so we try to basically making sure that it was absolutely zero handle, including the fridges, the wine fridge, obviously every cabinet. The stone itself is called neolith. It's a, spo a stone from Spain that has the appearance of a basalt, beautiful dark black. At the same time, can handle the heat, can handle the grease, and so it's extremely practical, not like marble. And it can handle the pit burners. I don't know if you notice that the burners are straight built into the stone, and so they have to handle, the stone has to handle the temperature uh, of, of the burners. We designed a floating staircase with structural steel. It's embedded in the wall behind the cabinetry, um, which allows each tread to float singularly without any visible support. It was a major architectural feature to the apartment. Primary bedroom is very Japanese. That's why you will see a futon on the tatami. Some people told me to put a bed on, on the tatami, but my, my take will be asking to put a bed on tatami is asking a sushi chef to put some ketchup on sushi, so it doesn't really work. Uh, so besides the tatami and the futon, to transition to the master bathroom, and you will notice that you have to go through a river of gravel, which is a mini Japanese garden that creates a separation of space between where you sleep and where you bath. When you get to the bathroom, you have a simple, pure space where the, the water side of it, so which is the shower, huge uh, rain shower and the bathtub are in together in the main space and they're sitting on a hinoki, so Japanese cypress wood. The owner had a very specific intent for the primary bath, creating a wet room with very specific materials such as hinoki wood um, for Japan to achieve a particular aesthetic. And the water can go through the floor and there's a drain below the hinoki floor. With all the development that's in the area, it's really hot area in terms of new buildings and people wanting to move here. But this is one of the buildings in the area that is a pre-war true loft building, which is just so hard to find, which just makes this location and this building specifically that much more desirable. This is why this space is unique in this building. It has a basically a 50 feet by 50 feet huge square and that was part of my vision. A loft like this one is a once in a lifetime property. It really is incredibly unique. It's truly one of a kind property. Um, and that is what is so special about it. Um, this is the best, if not one of the most unique and one of a kind apartments in Williamsburg.